because a lot of what you're doing is really high stakes. Like some of the things I worked on there were literally life and death issues for other people. This is not decentralization theater where we just pretend the DAO is in control. The DAO is in control, right? When the DAO right. votes on an upgrade, right? If that if that upgrade passes, it will happen automatically on chain. What is the biggest threat to national security? Oh, wow. Okay. Um Welcome to the first ever episode of Beneath the Layers by Octane Labs, the show that goes one layer deeper than most, to learn more about the journeys behind the crypto industry's most notable leaders and what they're doing today. In today's episode, we spoke with Ed Felton, co-founder and chief scientist at Offchain Labs. Uh, we went a little bit into his time uh, being the deputy CTO to the president at the White House, uh, how being a professor at Princeton led him to working in crypto full time, and of course, his thoughts on the role that AI plays in crypto and politics today, and obviously a ton more. That being said, let's get into it. All right, Ed, what's going on? Hey, Hunter, how you doing? So this is the first episode. Um, yep. You know, for everyone tuning in, thank you. Uh, of course, we had to have, uh, you know, the chief scientist, one of the co-founders of Offchain Labs on the first uh, podcast, you know, coming out of Offchain Labs. So we thank you for coming on today. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Happy to be here. I think base level, really kind of want to just start off with like talking about uh, maybe your fields of expertise, uh, pretty much like, you know, your background, computer security, privacy, uh, IT, like what brought you to focusing most of your time on those fields um, and why, I guess? Yeah. So I've had a bunch of, I've worked in a bunch of different areas over my career and um one of the things I figured out in hindsight is that I actually like to change fields from time to time. And I really like to work in fields that are new and developing as opposed to ones that like where everything is sort of established and buttoned down. I kind of like the sense that we're still figuring out basic stuff about the area that we're working in. Uh, I like that a lot. And that's really what brought me to work in uh, internet technologies back in the 1990s, and then to start to work in um, cybersecurity and privacy, uh, start to work in public policy issues related to technology. And that ultimately also just led to crypto, where a lot of those things come together. And interestingly enough, I, I think it's it's definitely one of those fields where like you think that, um, I, I think a lot of industries over time uh, you feel like people become obviously uh, more and more experts, you know, in said fields. Uh, and I, I feel like over time we have a lot of fields uh, figured out. Whereas I feel like IT, privacy, computer security, anything related to like this, like you just said, new and developing technology, it's almost like the opposite. I feel like the more yeah. and more advanced technology gets, like the harder it is to figure out these problems that are coming about, right? Yeah. And this is what I love about working in this area and particularly working, doing, doing the kind of work that I do is like you're really in, not in undiscovered territory, but you're in lightly explored territory. So there are always new things to figure out. And um, so much of what we do is stuff that no one has ever done before. Um, and I really enjoy that, that sort of sense of mapping out the territory and figuring out what's going on. And, um, and, and I think one of the things that's most fun for me is to bring knowledge and ideas from other areas to solve new problems. This idea that we're figuring out how to put together little pieces of knowledge and uh, kind of understanding figuring out what we're doing instead of just um, trying to produce something that we know how to produce, really just figure out how, how to do it or even what we should be trying to do. Right. Right. It's like not necessarily testing and prod, but like, you know, building and learning as we go, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is why I got interested in um, internet security early on because when internet technologies and web technologies were new, a lot of what we now know about security, a lot of the stuff that people now do, uh, people were just figuring out basic stuff like uh, what, how do you manage an account and how do you log in to, uh, to things on the internet? What even could you do? What kind of services even could you deliver across the internet 
to end users and how could those be made secure? So like basic stuff was still getting figured out. Most of what we take for granted today, including things like watching video online or listening to audio and all the things needed even to make like podcasting work wasn't really figured out then. Uh, you know, people didn't know how to do it. They had general ideas, but they didn't know how to do it securely. Um, and now we sort of take that stuff for granted. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that folks like me were working on back in the 80s and 90s and, and aughts, um, now it's gotten more routine. And, you know, because I like to work more on the frontier, I've kind of moved on to, uh, to newer stuff. Yeah, totally. And it's, it's, it's cool that like, again, as you said, uh, you, you kind of adapted over the years and um, I guess in a way, like always been on the cutting edge of the industry. Uh, I love to try to anyway. Yeah, I tried to. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> um, well, like, in that case, where did, where did you actually start uh, your career for the most part in like, you know, IT technologies and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I guess my um, work with computers goes way, way back to when I was a teenager, actually, oh, wow. um, back in the 1970s. Um, just playing around. So back then we had, we had one of the first uh, Apple II computers in, in, in our home when I was growing up. And back then, you know, if you wanted to have a, um, a computer game, you had to write it yourself. Um, there weren't even really at that point much, there wasn't much in the way of commercial software for, uh, for personal computers. Um, and so it really was sort of a hands-on programming, exploring kind of experience um, right from the beginning. So I enjoyed sort of playing around with computers, writing code, trying to see what you could do, um, even from back then. So then eventually I went off to college. My idea was I'm going to become a scientist. Um, I studied physics as an undergraduate. Oh, you're I kind of those. knew even okay. by the end of, yeah. <laughs> I kind of knew even by the end of my degree that um, I enjoyed uh, doing uh, things with computers more. Um, and so after I graduated from college, I got a job as a programmer in a computational physics lab and moved on from there. Um, and uh, really, it was pretty clear to me already by the time I was like 20 partway through college. Um, that I wanted to pivot and do computer stuff, but I really didn't know much more than that. And the rest of it sort of has been just one step after another of sort of figuring out, Oh, what's the next interesting thing to do? Totally. Yeah, and, and, and I think, um, you know, part of that, like part of that interest to always be working on the cutting edge of uh, technology, um, you know, I think also kind of coincides with being able to teach the previous generation about, that technology that you learned that you yourself have learned about uh and you yeah. yourself were a prince uh sorry professor at princeton right yeah yeah i was at i taught at princeton for 28 years altogether um and i really enjoyed it i enjoyed a lot working with students the you know the work first of all just working with working with young people is fun and cool and you learn a huge amount especially if you're in a tech field right the um there's such a danger of getting stale and losing touch with what's happening at the cutting edge. So unless you're actually building stuff that people use every day, or you're dealing with, with customers or users is one way to sort of stay connected. The other way is to actually be a teacher and um, have students around all the time and just see what they're interested in, what they're doing. Um, and so I enjoyed that a lot. I also enjoyed one of the things that's been really useful to me all along is the connection between teaching and building your own understanding as a researcher or developer. Because, you know, sometimes I, people say that if you want to really understand something, teach it. And I, I certainly found that to be true because teaching is all about figuring out sort of what's really fundamental about something, what is kind of the simple mental model of that thing that um, is going to click for people. Um, and that exercise of taking advanced knowledge and figuring out how to explain it and convey it at a more basic level, is, I think really important. Um, and just the practice of doing that, you learn a huge amount about 
sort of how to organize knowledge, how to think about stuff. And I think it really is true that you learn a ton by teaching, especially, and not just sort of the, I'm going to tell you information, but the sort of more basic, what is it I should be telling you? How can I explain this to someone? How can I understand what they're not seeing and how to convey it to them? You sort of really have to understand something in a much more thorough way in order to teach it. It's also true of writing, writing about technology. I think I've done a tremendous amount of writing over my career. And I think that's also really useful as a thinking tool. Totally. No, yeah. And, and I think it's um, the, uh, I'm sure what it also helps is having, you know, actually interested students, right? Those that are oh, yeah. li listening to you and actually like saying like, wow, like this is a great way you're teaching me. Like what else is there? Like what more can we work on? Maybe even together and stuff like that, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it is amazing to see that light bulb go on in someone's brain where they, um, where they sort of get something and they've wrapped their heads around it and now they're excited about applying it. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and you certainly get that a lot um, in, in teaching. Um, if you, if you're doing it right, you, you get that. And I, I found that to be like incredibly rewarding, to, not only to see that happen, but then to be able to work with those people as they like, um, you know, it's like sort of in a sports analogy, you can imagine someone who is carrying the ball in whatever sport it is. And suddenly they like see a big open field in front of them and they just like go yeah. racing into it. It's that sense. That's a great analogy. That happening. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I think it's true in research a lot, especially in academic research where you're almost heading for the hardest problems. Right. Um, that, you know, you spend a lot of time grinding and a lot of, t you spend a lot of time where you don't feel like you're making progress. And then like yeah. all of a sudden you can sur really surge forward. And there is that sense that you've sort of had a breakthrough and it's so exciting and you're going to race forward. And like after the fact, you know, you, you tell a story about it. If you like read some research paper, it's like, it's told as a story about kind of inevitable forward progress. We did this thing and it logically led to the next thing. And that logically right. led to the next thing. And we just marched from one to the other. But actually what happened usually is you wandered around all over the place and you got <laughs> stuck and you got frustrated and then suddenly you had a breakthrough. And then afterward, you kind of make up a story about how you would have done it if you knew everything from the beginning. But oh, like boy. that process of figuring stuff out, I think is, um, I really enjoy even, and in so some ways, even just the part of it where you're really grinding and not seeming to make progress. Right. Yeah, it's it's almost like a magical a magical kind of combination of like needing to have like product market fit, uh, consumer interest, uh, yeah. obviously the tech you know kind of down and research down, um, but like it's in, in in a way I'm sure like there's also like a like a small part of luck in there, you know whatever that means I guess in this industry there is luck for sure. Um, yeah, I mean luck plays a big role in it, and I think a lot of what a lot of success in areas like this feels like luck. Um, I also think though, that the, um, you know, there are various sayings about this, but, um, one of my favorite ones comes from an old baseball person who said, uh, the harder I work, the luckier I get, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. The idea being that, um, a lot of what you're doing, I think when you're doing the grinding is you're creating opportunities to get lucky. Totally. Right. And th this is, it's, that's kind of the idea, right? The harder you work and the smarter you work, the more you have opportunities to get lucky. And at some point, you know, what you hope is that you expose yourself to enough opportunities to get, to get lucky. And that's like one of the advices people give if you're writing, if you're stuck, just like get out a piece of paper and write anything or a piece of paper in the old days, nowadays, open up a window and just like write okay. anything. Don't care if it's terrible. Don't care if it's on topic. Same kind of thing. If you're stuck in some like technical research area, just start building something. Um, just like make, pro get some momentum towards something and like give yourself a chance to discover something you didn't, didn't expect. Well, but then when you get a thing, just like when you get a valuable thing, just like really run with it like push all your chips in on that thing for a while. 
once you found something that's really good. Very true. And, and, you know, I think um, to to go back a little bit to, uh, you know, of course, you being a professor at Princeton um, and, you know, having interested students, that kind of happened to you at some point, no? Uh, you know, obviously the off-chain labs today, if you want, you can talk well, about it. The story of arbitrage, it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a good example, actually. Um, it's a good example of like a combination of thinking for a long time about like basic challenges in how to right. do smart contracts. So like the story of the birth of Arbitrum basically was, you know, I started doing research in, in uh, blockchain tech in maybe 2012. Um, and at a certain point, I got really excited about the idea of smart contracts, that this was something which could take what was pre- what I previously thought about as being like a, a way of something like Bitcoin, where you had these, you had this, this token or currency and people could move it around. You could have that, like these sorts of financial trans- transactions. But the idea that this would become a platform where people could build applications that could do literally almost anything um, and do that on this kind of shared um, virtual computer um, right. that I like got really excited about that thought thought at the time I think it was obvious to a lot of people um, me being one of them that um, that this was going to be a big deal um, but you know as a person who is always analyzing technology, thinking about how to build it and so on. This, the limitation around scalability, this, you know, how much could you do on a smart contract enabled blockchain? Um, you know, that seemed like a really important problem to work on. Um, and so mm-hmm. it's a problem I started sort of grinding on at some point, sort of thinking about different ways that you could do it. Um, and through a lot of, and so anyway, I worked on this problem for a while. Um, a bunch of uh, students worked on a very early version of Arbitrum as a, as a course project. And then this weird opportunity came along. I got invited to go work at the White House for a couple of years. And you're not going to say no to that, right? Um, and I didn't. Not. So I went off and I worked at the White House for a couple of years. And on January 20th of 2017, um, we all got pushed out the door and a bunch of new people were coming in to work at the, to work at the white house. And I turned back into an academic. Um, and so I was sitting there sort of a little bit shell shocked from, um, and trying to sort of decompress after working at the white house, which is a super intense place to work. Exciting, but like I really unlike anything else. And while I was trying to figure out what to do. Oh, absolutely. Sure. There's definitely a couple of things. Like, so the hardest part, by the way, for with getting this set up was like figuring out what to talk yeah. about first. Because Arbitrum, oh yeah, was multiple places in your life, and you were kind of yeah. coming in and out of it. <laughs> it was in some ways kind yeah. of lucky. It, there's a sense in which the idea was it was sort of too early to build something like Arbitrum as a commercial product in 2015. Um, right. The market wasn't ready for it. The problem that it solved was not really even a problem yet because this is Ethereum insane, right? didn't have the kind of use, right? I Ethereum think it wasn't even value, ahead of its it? time. Well, so when we started the work on Arbitrum, yeah, Ethereum wasn't out yet. Um, so, you know, there's a sense in which we needed to wait if we were going to scale Ethereum for Ethereum to get a certain amount of critical mass. And what, you know, when we started um, the company to build Arbitrum off-chain labs, um, one of, one part of our, our big thesis was that um, scalability and transaction costs were going to be a major pain point for Ethereum users. And even then, even in 2018, 20, early 2019, it was not, not everyone accepted that as, as as being true or as being inevitable. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a sense in which the early Arbitrum was kind of too early for, it was ahead of the need. Um, but anyway, you know, I got invited to work at the White House and working at the White House um, is something you do if you're invited. So I did, um, yeah. And um, that two year hiatus turned out to be uh, actually maybe lucky in a way. But I don't know. Maybe the idea would have just sort of sat unrealized. 
Because what caused me to pick it back up is after I came back, turned back into an academic is one day these two uh, PhD students, Harry and Stephen, came into my office at Princeton. And they said, hey, remember that Arbitrum thing? Um, we think that's cool. Let's, uh, let's, do, let's do that again. And that's what kind of got the thing restarted and got us to, f- and at that time we really focused on, okay, we have this good core idea. How can we turn it into something more like a complete system? And that sort of was the rebirth of Arbitrum. And, you know, that's what led to, to everything really, right? Because we did the academic research and then eventually Harry and Stephen and I co-founded Offchain Labs to build it. And, um, you know, and, and it went from there. Um, that, by the way, was not the first time in my career when like a couple of students had just walked into my office and said, Hey, you want to do this thing? And I said, yes. And oh, wow. it became a major, um, a major turning point in my, uh, sort of in my career, the earlier one, that's why, I, that's what got me to, yeah. So something very similar happened, um, in, um, back in the nineties, uh, which got me working on security and privacy in the first place. Um, again, two PhD students in that case, uh, Dan Wallach and Drew Dean, um, came into my office one day and said, hey, you know, we've been working on um, this idea that there might be security issues in web browsers as they, uh, as they sort of start to turn into a platform for delivering applications. Um, and uh, we have this research that's mostly done. And if you have a couple weeks, let's like spend a couple weeks finishing this up and writing it up. So I'm like, yeah, I have a couple weeks. Oh. Um, and a couple of weeks turned into like a whole decade of work. Um, just like, again, this, like seeing the opportunity and grabbing it. Um, so when he, anyway, uh, when, uh, it must've been like 20 years later, Harry and Steven come into my office and say, Hey, let's work on this thing. I sort of had this deja vu and I'm like, first of all, I still thought the Arbitrum idea was cool. I was happy to have other people to work on it with. But also I just had deja vu from this like really almost really sort of pivotal time in my career when something very similar had happened earlier. I'm like, you should listen when grad students say something is cool and you should work on it. It's, a, it's okay for the first time. Did that yeah. turn into anything? Like a, that turned into like an actual product or? Not a product, but we, it turned into like a whole, it, it turned into a bunch of things. Um, that line of research, um, this was really around the time that like web security was born. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to think that our research project at Princeton had a role in helping that to happen. Um, we, we collected, we might have collected the very first bug bounty in history as part of this research. Oh, wow. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, I mean, it, it led to a lot of work. It was a big, uh, change in my career and the two students who were involved in that drew and Dan went on to really illustrious careers in the field. Um, and, um, so it didn't lead to products. So one of the interesting things about doing academic research is that some of the work that you do can turn into a specific product. Some of it is just about ideas. And when you're working in security and privacy, some of what you develop um, is about uh, understanding what people should and should not do. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that early research we did was pointing out a set of problems which have since been solved. And so some of the aspects of today's technologies are solutions to problems that we were talking about back then. Um, and that's, it's an important way to contribute to making, having an impact and making the technologies that regular people use better. Um, but it's not, it wasn't really the kind of thing that could become a standalone product. Like a lot of the ideas you work on in research, um, in academic research, it might be something that will improve a product that people use. 
So like if we came up with a better way to some uh, improvement to building, um, let's say, uh, operating systems, it's not like we would create our own new operating system that would compete with Windows and Mac OS and, and Linux, right? The ideas that we came up with would eventually get incorporated into those systems and get used. So I think a bunch of the things we worked on um, are used by um, internet users every day, but not sort of as a discrete product, just as like a feature or an improvement in the stuff that people were already using. That's amazing. So, one of the things that was unusual about Arbitrum as research was that it was able to be turned into a, a standalone product. Um, and that was partly because the area that we were working in was so new. Right. Um, right. So, I mean, I think it's telling that I worked for decades as a professor, and this is the first startup company that came out of my research because Arbitrum was the first time that all of the pieces were in place that we really could take this piece of research and turn it into a company rather than having the research try to improve commercial practice in some other way. Um, mm -hmm. But really, there's a whole bunch of stars that need to align just right for it to make sense to start a company out of that kind of research. It's got to be something that can be a product. It has to be something that, as opposed to being an addition to some existing product, it's got to be about the right size that you could do it as a small company. Right. Um, th there has to you have to be not entangled in some kind of intellectual property issue that stops you from doing it. Um, it has to solve a commercial problem that like has enough um, commercial value. The people that you work on it with have to be willing to actually go and start a company with you. Um, That's a good point. As like Harry and Steven were here. Um, there's a whole bunch right. of things that have to be true for it to make sense uh, to yeah. take that product, take that research and, and deliver its impact to people through a new company. And Arbitrum was the first time it, that happened for me, despite, you know, doing a lot of research for a lot of years. I think for, I think for what it's worth, you know, the, you have to have a very, very specific mind, I guess, to be a researcher. And, and by that, I mean, like, you have to like yeah. be really open to, in a way, almost like building for the open source. Like you, like you mentioned, like a lot of things don't end up turning into products. If anything, they get integrated into existing things that we use today. Yeah. But if it's not like, for example, I'm using the internet all day and I'm thinking, oh, okay, like this very specific feature was built by Ed Felton in the 90s. You know, like I, you almost have to be okay with researching things, maybe building out very small components of it and then letting other teams kind of almost pave, pave the way yeah. for whatever new product may come out of it, you know? And yeah, and some of the research is about uh, helping people understand what not to do. And right. that can be pretty valuable too. Something is not going to work. Something is not going to be secure. Um, you know, there's a category of security attacks that your system needs to resist. Um, and someone had to discover those attacks. Someone had to characterize them and start talking about how you could prevent them. And um, I mean, that's, that's valuable research too. Um, I always thought about academic research as trying to solve problems that industry, trying to contribute to making people's experiences with technology better, but do that in ways that industry was not likely to do on its own. Right. And so, like you said, that's, you know, you can think of it as an open source or sort of trying to produce a lot of what you do is trying to produce public goods, things that benefit everybody. Right. And, but that don't have a business model. Right. If something has a business model, it probably should be done in industry by industry. It probably will be done by industry if it's a thing that is obvious to do and it has a business model. So as an academic researcher, I was like all about trying to find ways to make things better that didn't have a business model. Um, sometimes you find one that does have a business model and Arbitrum is a good example of that. Right. But really, I didn't start out thinking, how can I make a product? I started out thinking, how can I solve this problem that is going to hold back what people can do? Um, right. And then 
as we developed it, we started to realize, hey, this has commercial, this has commercial potential. This could be a product, um, and you could actually make a go of it as a company building this thing. Totally. So, I want to I want to touch on um, a couple experiences that you may have had um, in yep. within the time that you've been teaching, um, and I guess some even in between the times. Uh, the first one I wanted to see if I could kind of uh, scratch your brain about, about is uh, the FTC. Uh, yeah. So I think, so a lot of people know you worked at the White House, by the way, and uh, you mentioned that yeah. earlier earlier on, but I don't think a lot of people realized you worked at the FTC early on. I did first, yeah. Yeah, so in 2011 right. and 12, I spent about a year and a half at the FTC, and I was their first chief technologist. So the FTC, cool. um, it's a... So we like to say it's a small but mighty agency, uh, definitely small, uh, <laughs> right. often at its best mighty. Um, and it has two jobs. Um, one job is um, consumer protection. So a big part of that is actually going after people who do scams. Mm. Um, you know, there's, you know, there are people who will hang out a shingle and sort of pretend to be a business and take people's money. And then uh, not do anything at all or worse, right? Um, and so that's a big part of it. But then also the FTC uh, is one of the enforcers of privacy laws in the U.S. in practice. So a lot of the work that we did was around things like online privacy. And we had investigations around big companies like Facebook and Google um, and so on. Uh, the other thing the FTC does is um, antitrust or competition. Uh, which is about making sure that companies that are very large and powerful don't misuse that power to the detriment of um, of consumers or or end users. And so the FTC decided the the then chair of the FTC, who's the head of the agency, um, realized that a lot of what they were doing, much more of what they were doing, was about technology and the internet, and they wanted to bring have some in house expertise. And so they created this position of chief technologist, and I was the first person recruited into that role. And I spent about a year and a half doing that, um, oh. which meant that I kind of was working on some of the important issues that the agency was working on at that time. And I guess that's another job you don't say no to, right? <laughs> I mean, this was a harder decision to make because right. I didn't have experience working in government. I knew it was going to be very different. Um, it was not... There, in some ways, it was difficult to step away from my academic job because although Princeton would give me leave to do public service for something like this, um, it does mean sort of stepping away from a full time job, stepping away from a research uh, group and enterprise that had been that I had built up over time and going away and like mostly being absent for a year and a half or so. It also meant, you know, the job was in Washington. My family was living in New Jersey right. and with a kid in school who we didn't want to move and then move again. Um, it meant being separated from my family half the, half the week. Um, so not, a, not that easy a decision. Um, but as always, um, I chose to do the thing that would be interesting and, um, a new experience and that I would learn from. Um, and yeah, so I did that for a year and a half and learned a lot about how, how government works on these things. It was a really valuable experience to work in a, in what's in many ways, a regulatory agency. Right. Um, but also to think about how, um, especially the problem of just pure scams online and, you know, what, what can be done about them, how to enforce and how to investigate those things. Because kind of an agency like the FTC, there's their consumer protection workload. There's kind of two pieces to it. One is just the pure scams, the people who um, are just in it to uh, get people's money and um, or their credit card numbers or something in order to exploit them. Um, and then the other side of it is legitimate companies that are overstepping. They might be overstepping the bounds of the law on privacy or something. And um, 
you know, for example, during this time, during the time I was there, there was a big privacy investigation related to Facebook and their privacy practices um, that, you know, and that's an issue that's echoed down over the years. Um, anyway, it was a really interesting experience. I learned a lot about how government works um, and how regulation operates. I learned something about law enforcement, although the um, FTC doesn't enforce criminal law. They do do civil um, law enforcement. Um, very interesting experience and really changed my perspective on how, how laws and markets and technology kind of fit together. Mm. And, and that was, so that was, you went there in 2010. Um, I th yeah. think, did, did you hear anything at all about like, any murmurings about like Bitcoin at the time? Because I think Bitcoin was like kind of came out a year or two prior to that. I, I didn't know uh, nothing. Abs I heard nothing about, right. um, about that, about that technology then. Right, right. And then, okay, yeah, at okay. least not in not in that role. Uh, it was only after I came back to academia that I started hearing about this stuff. Okay, interesting. Okay, and that was like what twenty twelve? You said roughly. Yeah, I think it was around twenty twelve. I started working yeah. on um, on issues around um, sort of the economics of Bitcoin consensus is is the thing that I worked on first. Sort of understanding uh, like does is proof of work consensus. Uh, stable is it incentive compatible in the in the jargon, um, and starting to talk about some of the ways in which it could fail. Okay, so like nothing related to like kind of Mt. Gox like trading and stuff like that. No, not so much. <laughs> of course, not, not so much. People just like so you know, it's been obvious since the beginning that if you have a custodial situation where someone is holding your money or holding your keys, that they can steal your money. Um, and totally. there's risks associated with that for sure. Um, but more about the kind of the, the protocol itself and the soundness of the, of the Bitcoin protocol, the soundness of proof of work consensus under what, under what conditions can it fail? What are some of right. the attacks against it? And also like, what is the, what is the role of social consensus in the stability of these systems? Um, right. Because the rules of consensus in Bitcoin or Ethereum or any sort of large distributed system like that, um, they're both it's consensus is both a technical mechanism of how the different nodes send bits to each other and do, cal do calculations and build blocks and all that stuff. Right, right. But it's also, there's also sort of a social aspect to it where people agree on what the protocol even is or what is correct behavior um, and sort of the way we've gotten really used to the idea that say Ethereum might have a hard fork on a particular scheduled planned date, but the idea that that's going to happen and that people are going to change the way their software behaves on a particular, you know, when at a particular time and date, that is a social agreement. And so right. we started thinking a lot about sort of the ways in which these systems are a combination of technical agreement and social agreement. And that's one, that was sort of my way into to working on thinking about a uh, blockchain tech overall. Uh, so then that was, so that was in between the time of you leaving the FTC and I guess joining. And before I White went House. to the white house. Yeah. So then uh, okay. also in my, as a role, in my role as kind of an academic organizer, uh, we organized a conference on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency technologies in 20, early 2014 at Princeton, oh, okay. where we brought a lot of, say, Bitcoin core developers and other folks together. It was one of the first academic conferences on that topic. We also did some teaching, worked on making a uh, uh, making a uh, an online course um, about um, about the topic that led to a textbook and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and that was another piece of it to try to take, to try to take this topic and figure out how it could be something that we could teach about and do, uh, academic research on, because it wasn't obvious sort of how to do that, at least at first. And I, right. that's a lot of what I was working on in between my FTC stint and then my later White House stint. 
So, yeah, so, so, okay. So, you, so then pretty much before White House, you were kind of, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to say Bitcoin Maxi, of course, but you know, you were, you know, trying to solve, or I guess, you know, uh, talking about the uh, kind of consensus yeah. stuff around Bitcoin. Uh, what made you want to say, okay, let's, let me go ahead and uh, take that offer from the White House. I guess work for Barack Obama at the time, I, 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 yeah. I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was during um, the, more or less the last two years of the Obama administration. Yeah. yeah. So, like, how did that happen? You know, we, we, yeah. you know like, <laughs> I love so to hear about think, that whole situation. Yeah, yeah, this is interesting. People think of the government as super bureaucratic. So everybody thinks, right. oh, you must have gone through this super formal process. It took like yeah. months. Now, here's how it actually happened. So um, I was part of a group of computer scientists who were, um, who wrote a kind of white paper on encryption policy that we, uh, because we were worried about some of the things we were hearing from the government and we wanted to kind of talk to people in the administration at the time to, uh, about our views on this and why we thought they should be careful not to, uh, not to try to clamp down on end to end encryption. So there's a group of us computer scientists who kind of wrote this white paper and we asked for a meeting with some white house staff, um, and so we got this meeting and so we go in and um, we have a meeting with a bunch of White House people on one side of the table and us on the other side of the table and um, very useful, serious conversation. Afterward, I was talking to some one of the White House staff people there who I knew um, and um, he's like, um, hey, you want to go to lunch? And so I'm like, sure, okay, I'll go to lunch. You know, we can catch up. Um, this is a person who I'd known over the years, hadn't worked okay. with really closely, but had sort of crossed paths with a bunch. And um, it's the kind of person who I would have lunch with if, um, uh, you know, if we were both in the same place. So I'm like, sure, go to lunch. So, um, you know, over lunch at some point, um, you know, during this conversation, he says, hey, you know, is there any chance that you would be interested in coming to work here? And I'm oh, like, boy. well, I am do for a sabbatical. Yeah. Let's like, let me think about that. Um, so he's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll think about that as well. You know, we'll see if like, maybe we can make something work. So, um, I go back to Princeton like the next day, if I, as I remember it, or anyway, very soon afterward, we like exchange emails. Yeah. You know, there's some interest on both sides and he's like, well, can you come for a job interview? And I'm like, well, you know, my schedule is really packed. The only day I could come is tomorrow. Um, but I doubt I like that'll that. work for you. And he's like, well, we can make that work. So <laughs> Make it work like, on your time. It's a power move. <laughs> I mean, I kind of had to. At, at that time, it wasn't like there was a job offer or anything. It seemed like it was right. probably not likely to happen. But yeah, I'll come and do an interview. So like I come almost right away for an, for an interview and uh, spend the um, – and spend the day meeting people there. And, you know, I have lunch with the person who would be my boss there and the conversations would go pretty well. And it's kind of interesting. And, um, so like afterwards I go back to Princeton and like, there's a little bit more back and forth and we decide basically informally that there's mutual interest. So the thing to note is it's like five or six days since the first conversation and I've already wow. interviewed and they've already sort of informally decided that they would like to have me join. And I've informally decided that I want to come um, very fast and yeah. entirely informal. Um, then if you're going to work at the White House, like you have to be background checked by the FBI. Um, and that takes that takes a while. That takes like over a month. So we went from this very fast sort of informal, yeah, we're, we're all interested. We've talked about it. You know, I have some understanding of what I might work on, what my role might be. And then like, we pretty much decide we want to do it on both sides. And then, then there's a lot of process after that. Um, wow. So it happened really quickly. It happened through informal channels. And um, it made sense in the sense that, you know, they had a lot of... Uh, issues to work with that um, where sort of experience and knowledge and connections in the computer science field would be really useful. Um, and I was interested and um, was due for a sabbatical leave. 
So I could step away from what I was doing at, at Princeton. It just made a lot of sense on both sides and it happened really quickly. Wow. Um, yeah. So like six weeks later, I like showed up and got my badge um, basically and just started wow. working. Okay. Yeah. So what were the, what were like the, like the interactions like over there? I mean, like, like were you in the kind of position where like, you know, president had something that needed to be solved from like, I guess like a technical perspective, he kind of looked over at you and like gave you the nod kind of thing or <laughs> like, well, yeah. I mean, so the white house staff is like a thousand people ish. Um, okay, so it's pretty right big. Um, and it's not like I saw the president every day. Um, but they did have a lot of things going on. Um, a lot of, st- so th- the government is really big and it has a very, very broad mission. Um, and a lot of those things, and the White House staff is kind of, well, so one thing, right, one thing that was true about the job role I had was that I didn't have any power over anyone. Um, my job was to help make the people sort of at the top of the White House uh, hierarchy um, as smart and effective as they could be on the topics where I knew stuff. Right. Right. So my job is to make the president and the chief of staff and sort of their teams um, smarter and better on the topics that where I knew stuff. And that involved a bunch of things. Um, So let me just give you like a sample of the kind of things that we would work on. Um, So at that time, this was the government was, uh, was developing, the Department of Transportation was developing a policy on uh, self-driving vehicles. Okay. And so, you know, they're doing a big study. There were various standards that were, and regulations that they were talking about and guidance documents. And so one of the things I worked on was to work with those teams and to be part of the sort of, um, liaison or connection between the White House team and the Department of Transportation as they worked on those things, right? And so I brought particular things to the table, which is that I could do deeper dives on the um, the sort of, uh, you know, AI machine learning technology involved there on questions of technical feasibility. So there's stuff like that. I worked on some issues. Um, I worked a bunch on, on encryption policy I worked some on a bunch of national security issues related to where technology was important. Um, And that included some things around counterterrorism and a bunch of other things like that. Um, Some of it was helping people understand what was um, what's going on in some security areas, sort of sort of my connections and background in cybersecurity and privacy became important. So they decide there was a, there was a bunch of work around a national commission and a sort of policy initiative to try to beef up security in the cybersecurity in the government and, and across, um, and across sort of the whole U S and I played a role in that again, as you know, one part of a team working on that. There's a lot of emphasis on teamwork of people who bring different knowledge and, expertise and, um, uh, and connections to, uh, to a particular topic. It's one of the things I like didn't fully appreciate before I worked there is how many different actually useful angles the government has on particular issues. So one of, one of the biggest things I worked on was AI and machine learning. And I was kind of helping to drive a national policy initiative in that area. I, um, and one of the things I was doing was working on a sort of report or sort of national strategy document on that and trying to, um, work on making sure that the text for that got produced and also shepherding it through the review process. So it's amazing how many different parts of the technology of the government have some skin in the game about machine learning. So like the department of interior the National Park Service, they actually care a lot about certain things. Why? Because, well, they manage a lot of wilderness land 
and they use drones to try to understand what's going on there and watch for fires and you know take wildlife censuses and understand how the forests are doing and so on. So they care a lot about drones and drone policy. On the one hand, they want to use drones to like keep track of what's happening on the land that they, they're responsible for. On the other hand, they also want to keep tourists from doing really stupid things with drones in national parks and injuring <laughs> yeah. each other or, you know, okay. uh, or damaging something. Um, and so like the Department of Interior, the National Park Service cares about drone policy. You wouldn't think it, but they do. It's like random. Um, it's like you, you would never know, you know. Yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. So like when we worked on this national policy document for AI and machine learning, there were, if I remember correctly, 45 different parts of the government that like had edits and review and ultimately had to sign off on what we were saying. And this is everything from, you know, the Department of Education, which cares about uses of this technology in education to... Um, the military cares a lot about arms control considerations around um, autonomous weapons. That's like a scary and super important topic. Right. Um, just like so many things going on. So a couple of things that were unusual about the White House job among any job I've ever had. The, the pace and the sheer number of things going on was like unlike anything I've ever seen. Really? Um, yeah, partly because the number of important things that need to be reviewed by the White House team is really large and the team is relatively small. So there were just a lot of, there's a lot of things like, oh, the attorney general is giving a speech in an hour and a half and has sent over the text of the speech for review in case we have any issues we want to raise. So could you look at this section, which is about technology okay. and in, in 20 minutes, give like, do we, do we, the white house want to give feedback on it? So there's oh, some wow. of that, like that's a, a lot surprising. of surprising really short. It, and it's not like I get to edit the attorney general's speech, but <laughs> You know, right. I look at, I might look at the text and see, do we have an issue we want to raise? Is there anything that he's going to say that might be crosswise with some other policy thing going on? Um, is there anything that any other part of the government is doing that he might want to take into consideration that I might know about? So, um, you know, there's some you, of that just, sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, definitely not to interrupt you there, but like, would you, yeah. would you consider that, um, things actually move quicker than they look, uh, you know, like internally than they do on the outside. Cause I feel like when people yeah. talk about government, they say everything's very bureaucratic, everything moves very slowly, but maybe that, you know, it's just the wrong point of view that we're looking at it from. Yeah. So there's some things that are supposed to move slowly and do fair enough, like passing new laws that move slowly. A lot of things move slowly, but a lot of things happen on a really fast pace a lot of what happens is done informally. Um, a lot of it is, can you vet this thing? Some of it is, has to do with the news cycle. So to give you another example, you know, I might get to work one day uh, when I'm working at the White House and um, overnight there was uh, some kind of security breach at some company. I mean, who knows what, but it's something that might've affected a lot of people. So the... Um, the White House press secretary is going to do his daily press briefing, you know, at some point, I forget what time it was, like 1230 or one o'clock or something. Um, and he might get a question about it. So like when I was new, someone might say, hey, Ed, um, Josh is going to do this, um, this uh, press briefing at, at, you know, and can you give him like two or three bullet points of what we know about this incident. And then like some things to say or not say in response to questions. Often the oh, not man. say is really important, right? right? Like if we don't know something, it's really important that he not say anything, that he not try to fill that in. Like That's this pressure. is a That's subject. A lot of pressure. Yeah. A lot of, I mean, he's under incredible pressure and the work that the press secretary does is sort of awe inspiring. Wow. But anyway, like on some, when I was new, someone might, um, 
just ask me, Hey, he might want this. But also, you know, once I had a little more experience, I was like, Oh, um, this thing happened overnight. I should like prepare this like quarter page sort of capsule briefing thing about it because someone internally is going to want to know. Um, right. And so a lot of it is responding to events. Some of it is coordination across different parts of the government. Um, a lot of business is done informally. Um, there's a lot of preparation for important things. There's a lot of, so it was like the never ending giant, ever growing to-do list. And then like my calendar when I was there was always like almost all day is like one at all times, one meeting plus like two other meetings that I said no to. <laughs> um, that's right. just like the nature of it. The amount of stuff going on is enormous. The other thing that's different about that job is high stakes, right? Sure. Because a lot of what you're doing is really high stakes. Like some of the things I worked on there were literally life and death issues for other people. Yeah. Um, right. You're talking about something like counterterrorism. This is serious stuff, really serious stuff, right? People die and um, disasters happen. People's lives are ruined. And of course, and then, you know, there's super important civil liberties issues around what the government does um, to uh, protect against terrorism as well. So there's a lot of really high, really high stake stuff. Um, you know, one of the, the other thing that people there worry about is what is going to happen in the very worst case, right? If there, if there were to be another 9-11 or something even worse, um, you know, these are the people who would be in charge of dealing with it. And so right. people are thinking about these things and there's contingency planning. And so you think about things where that are incredibly high stakes, much more so than any other job I've ever been in. Even things like economic policy, right. very high stakes, you know, good economic policy versus bad economic policy. That means, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people losing their jobs or not. Right. Um, super high stakes stuff for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, right. And that's just like a constant, that's just like a constant there. Um, there's a sense that, that what you're working on is incredibly important and in, and in ways that no other job I've ever had really has ever had stakes like that. So in like, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? It's, a, it's kind of like a, kind of like a double-edged sword there. It's like, like you just said, you're like the, the things that you're doing day to day, like the decisions that you're making very, very, you know, you know, like life changing stuff for certain people. But um, like, you know, so, so it makes, it's kind of gratifying to a certain extent to know that you have some sort of say, but on the other yeah. side, it's like, I'm sure it's a lot of stress. Like it's also I mean, terrifying. FTC... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure. Because <laughs> here's the thing. Stuff goes fast and right. decisions have to be made. To be clear, never by me. I was never the decision maker. Okay. Right? It was a... a little less stress, but still stressful. <laughs> but I'm advising the decision maker. And, yeah. <laughs> and the decision is being made with the best information available and the best advice available if I'm doing my job well. Um, right. as a staffer, right. Um, but still incomplete information, right. There is a sense that, you know, the president or other senior people, they're making incredibly important decisions. They're making them fast. They're making them with incomplete information, um, and with super high stakes. And, um, and if I do my job well versus poorly, they might make that decision better. Right. So it's not my decision. On the other hand, I feel a sense of responsibility for making sure that um, that um, for making sure that that's done as well as it can be. Um, and a lot of people there have these jobs where or these roles where uh, it's super high stakes um, and you have to make peace with that. The idea that I'm going to give my best advice, I'm going to get the best information I can. It's never going to be complete. Right. Um, 
I'm going to feel like it's not enough. And I have to just make peace with the idea that I'm going to do my best and that, um, you know, that someone has to do this job and I'm a pretty good person for it. I'm going to give my best work and that has to be good enough. So do you think then maybe that, like maybe like that coupled with, you know, whatever else kind of uh, gave you that push to, you know, maybe move out of the White House and into, I guess, you know, what would be Arbitrum today? Yeah, well, so I knew from the beginning uh, when I went to work in the Obama White House, uh, he was in his second term. There is no third term. Um, That's a good point. And so yeah. I knew that on that I knew that on January twentieth, twenty seventeen, my job was going to be over, and I was going to go back to Princeton. Um, right. That was kind of understood from the beginning that it was a time limited thing. Um, and so, and that's what happened is I went back um, and like, I was a little bit kind of dazed and confused um, and decompressing after the White House job, which was super intense. Um, yeah. And I turned back into an academic. I didn't have a plan for what was going to come next, except I was going to be an academic again. And so, um, but after a couple of months back, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the thing that's now sort of um, off-chain labs or Arbitrum legend, Harry and Steven coming to my office and saying, let's work on this together. Right. And we started doing that, but still it was a path of over a year, a year and a half before uh -huh. we then took that desire to work on Arbitrum. And we actually like built a proof of concept version of it. We wrote a paper about it. A lot of development of the ideas happened over time um, to get to the point where we even decided we wanted to start a company. Totally, and 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 I think um, you know just just knowing that that the the whole idea kind of well, I should say the initial idea came about in 2015. Uh, you know, fast forward two three years later. 14. Uh, 2014. Okay, never mind. Yep. <laughs> Jeez, I feel like every That's time fine. we talk, it's like another year before. Um, <laughs> um, like you, you guys had the idea of of, of scaling like. For uh, you know, like a long time ago, before obviously yeah. it, it came into production, but my question here is: Why scale Ethereum? Why so not why like Ethereum and why not time? something else? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, the, there's some technical reason reasoning there too, but yeah, why Ethereum? Why not? Yeah. Scale? So, I mean, when we first did the when we first did the work, it was just about scaling smart contract execution generally, and right. the academic version of Arbitrum we made a big deal about how the technology was sort of agnostic as to what the layer one underneath it was. Um, and that this was one of the strengths of the technology that you could take the Arbitrum method and do it on any, on top of any layer one. But then when we wanted to turn it into a product, obviously a product needs to be built on some chain. And at that point we looked around and, um, and we looked at sort of what existed that met our technical needs. And then among the things that met our technical needs, we wanted a system that we thought was robust, that had the, the right kind of community um, and the sort of developer interest that was there. And Ethereum really stood out. Ethereum, there wasn't anything else really like Ethereum in terms of the, the ambition that Ethereum had and the community that it had was really just stood out above everything else. So we decided like right away, we wanna build this thing on top of Ethereum. And there was a lot of research, a lot of work we had to do to figure out how to build it on top of Ethereum and then how to make it Ethereum compatible. That combination of being built on Ethereum and the chain itself being compatible with Ethereum was really powerful. And I th think we saw early on that it would be, but we didn't but we had to do a lot of work to figure out how to actually make that real, how to actually build that. Wow. And, and I guess at the time there was, if, if I'm correct, there weren't that many different uh, uh, solutions out there to uh, scaling Ethereum, was there? No, not really. There was, there, people talked about state channels and plasma. And early on, right. actually, a lot of people would ask us, all right, is, are you doing state channels or are you doing plasma? And they get confused when we said, no, no, it's some third thing. It's a third thing. Um, right. Because the concept of rollups didn't really, not only the, the concept wasn't really out there um, and the, the term didn't exist yet. Um, so what we were doing was different from those things. Um, and they're both pretty limited. Um, 
we really felt like the solution we had was uh, was more powerful and had more applications than uh, than the others that existed at the time. Of course, you know, there's been a big, uh, a lot of growth of different solutions since um, since then, and a lot of them. Um, a lot of them have similarities with Arbitrum, which I think makes sense, right? Because the right solution, you know, if, as people get smarter about building things, they they tend to converge on some on the ideas that work best. And there's some similarities to like the original Arbitrum idea, and there's some similarities between things we discovered along the way and team, things other teams have discovered along the way. Um, you know, there's certain kinds of design approaches that make sense. But definitely it's been a long process to kind of figure out, to go from the core idea to having the whole product and all the pieces that fit together the way they do. And we learned a lot, we experimented a lot, and we learned a lot from the market as we we figured this out. It was a long process, right? It was like about three years from founding the company until we had our first mainnet launch. Oh yeah. Wow. That's a good point. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Cause it was 2021 when Mina launched, right? It was 21. Yeah. It's August of 21 at the end of August, 2021. And it was around the end of August, 2018 that we formed the company. I mean, at that point, the company was just like a signed piece of paper and a few thousand dollars in a bank account. <laughs> right. Um, right. So, I mean, it, it took time to build the team, but it also took a lot of time to figure out what the product should be and how to build it to get to that point of product market fit. We had to iterate a lot. We had to discover a lot of things along the way. Right. Right. And and then of course, you know, fast forward to uh, 2023 this year, March, um, you know, the whole kind of giving away of the product uh, happened in a way like, and, and it's funny yeah. going back to like the research the conversation, launch. it's kind of similar in a way, right? Like you're almost saying, Here's this kind of, uh, you know, uh, in this case, product this time instead of just just research. Yeah. Uh, and you're kind of letting other people use it. Well, right. I mean, so not only use it, but also actually govern and control it. And govern it. Right. right. The That's idea good. that yeah. decentralization has been key to what we're trying to achieve from the beginning. This idea of decentralization is really core to the whole thing. Um but of course, we've discovered along the way how to make how to turn that from a goal into a set of practices and technologies and practices and structures. And the the launch of the Arbitrum DAO was a big part of that. We we had known for a long time that we wanted to um, that we wanted ultimately to have a structure where the community was in control of how the tech of of how the chains developed and. Um, and for setting directions. Um, but just as with developing the core technology, it took quite some time to figure out, to go from having that as a goal to actually figuring out what were all the structures needed to make that real and then actually uh, you know, seeing that created. Um, so it was a long, it's something we've been aiming toward for a long time, but um, it, obviously super happy to have seen it happen and to have seen uh, and to have seen the interest and the sense of ownership that people in the DAO have taken in, in what's going on. You know, the thing, one of the things you worry about with the launch of something like community governance is that people just will like shrug and, and ignore not it. Not care. And, uh, right. Not yeah. care. Yeah. Yeah. And we see a lot of engagement. We see people really talking about um, what they would like to see and how they'd like things to go. Um, and that's really exciting. Obviously, it's super early days, but um, but you know, I think it's a really important step. And um, like I said, one that we had been hoping to take for a long time. Wow. So then, with with that big step then out of the way, um, you know, I'm sure like a lot of the kind of uh, research and stuff happening behind the scenes at Opting Labs has kind of shifted a little bit too. Uh, like, like, what are you working on nowadays at Opting? Yeah, there's a bunch. There's a bunch of things going on. Um, one of the big changes, of course, is that now that the DAO is in control of what happens on the Arbitrum One, Arbitrum Nova chains, or any other chains they launch, right? It's going to be the DAO's decision what gets launched. Right. Um, 
But we're still, you know, we're going on, we're doing research, trying to understand how to build better roll-up systems um, and to, um, you know, and, um, and there's a bunch of different areas. Um, one area we're really looking at is sort of core protocol, um, where we've been trying to understand, um, and, and we've published some about this, um, trying to understand uh, what is the best uh, roll-up or settlement protocol that uh, that we can come up with that has the best, has the lowest cost in the, I mean, the optimistic protocols already have fantastically low cost in the happy case, but looking at trying to drive down the cost in the unhappy case or the case where there's a dispute, um, trying to make sure, so that's one important area, and, and there's some big advances in uh, the roll-up or challenge protocol that um, we're going to be talking about publicly pretty soon. Uh, so that's one important area. There's a whole bunch of important areas around um, the sort of pricing and uh, economics of the operation of the chain. It's super important for efficient operation that... Um, that people are paying, that users are paying fees that uh, line up with the costs that they're imposing on the system and making sure that the sort of the fee, that there is a fee model available that's sustainable over time is quite important. Um, we're looking a lot at, we've been looking for a long time at issues around the sequencer and decentralized sequencing, as well as um, uh, Transaction ordering policies, we've been looking a lot. People have talked a lot about is the first come, first serve transaction ordering policy that the sequencer uses, is that the right way? Or is there a way that um, more efficiently manages the issues around MEV? Been looking a lot at that stuff. Um, and, um, you know, that's a summary. With there's We have a really strong research team. Um, there's of course also research going on related to layer one because um, the Prism the Prism team um, is now part of uh, Off Chain Labs and um, they've been super involved. Those folks have been super involved in uh, layer one uh, research around how to make uh, Ethereum itself more robust and more efficient and uh, and so on. So there's a huge amount going on in the in the research team. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun doing this stuff and uh, working with a, a, a great team. It's great to hear. Yeah. I, and, and it's funny because I think um, it's uh, it's so it's so interesting to know that there's uh, like, like a lot of things being thought about behind the scenes that, you know, frankly, I'm sure a lot of the day to day users of Arbitrum One and, and Nova aren't even really concerning themselves with quite yet. I mean, there are other hot topics like, like one of the ones you mentioned was like the uh, decentralized sequencing. Um, mm -hmm. Or even that one. I mean, I don't know. Like, do you think like that that kind of topic there is like? Uh, do you think it's do you think it's as poor, as important as people maybe uh, think it is on Twitter? If that makes sense. I mean, I think it's important for sure that the that it's important to understand what are the, what are the choices there, and to make sure that the DAO understands the choices and can make uh, make a decision. Um, decentralization is always a goal. Sometimes there are trade-offs in decentralization where you have to give something up. If you're right. talking about decentralized sequencing, probably if you ask, well, what is the drawback? Um, to the extent there is one, it might have to do with the response time or the, the sort of latency. Um, the mm. question of like, how can you decentralize the sequencing process while still keeping um, the things that people really like about Arbitrum sequencing now? One is that it's really fast. Two is that it protects people against uh, things like front running and other right. kinds of sort of uh, unfair extractive practices. You want to make sure that when you decentralize that you don't give those things up. Or if you have to give up some, like make the delay a little bit longer, that you minimize that and that the DAO is making an informed decision about, about what, what the options are. Um, and we're really trying to, as a research team, and I, I know there are lots of other teams out there in the community also who are thinking about and working on these topics. Our off-chain labs team, we're trying to understand those issues as best we can, and we'll be communicating the, you know, the results and, and our best thinking about this to feed into the community discussion about what, but ultimately it's going to be the community that decides what happens on, 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 the, uh, you know, on the public arbitrage chains. Totally. 
Yeah, no, and and I think that that's got to be like one of the coolest things. It's the coolest things, but also like like a, a tiny bit scary, right? Like it's like that one per, like I mean, you know, there's, there's like a, that's yeah. definitely a percentage chance where it's like the DAO says, you know what, we don't think that's important, and just doesn't let's say include whatever upgrade it yeah. is, right? If it's not important to the DAO, then it shouldn't be happening in the DAO chain. I mean, it's that simple. We don't, yeah. You know this this is not decentralization theater where we just pretend the DAO's in control. The DAO is in control, right? Not only does the DAO vote on all of these things, but you know, Arbitrum has on-chain actuation of what the DAO votes. That is when the DAO is voting on a software upgrade, if they vote yes, that um, governance contract will do the upgrade directly. It's not like the DAO's not voting to tell some multi-sig to do a thing. When the DAO right. votes on an upgrade, right? If that if that upgrade passes, it will happen automatically on chain. Um, so yeah, it's a real thing. Um, but of course, this is, you know, this is what we wanted to happen, right? It's been the goal to actually turn over control to the community, um, and as long as the DAO democracy process is reflecting the interests and needs and goals of the community, then, um, then I'm happy. Um, that's beautiful. I mean, by the way, I, on beautiful. the other hand, it doesn't really matter <laughs> if I'm happy, right? The DAO's in, the DAO's in charge. Point. It's going to do what it's going to do. Um, I, you, know, if, you know, from a research standpoint, though, you know, we're trying to figure out what we're trying to answer these questions, understand what are the trade-offs, what are the best what is what are the best options available? Um, and but it's exciting. You know, I came I came from an academic research world where we worked on problems that we that were important and that were going to have impact on the world, but usually in an indirect way and over time. Right? You mm -hmm. sort of think that you're part of building this, putting new bricks into this wall of knowledge which is going to pay off for people over time. Um, you know, and I absolutely believe that the work that computer science academic researchers do does do that and it pays off huge for everyone. But that payoff is kind of indirect, right? The exciting thing about being in research in the kind of position that I and our team are in now is we're doing technical work that is as hard and challenging and interesting as what our academic research teams did. But the stuff that we do is going to affect real decisions that about products that a lot of people use um, and soon. Um, and that connection, that closer connection to practice and to the impact on real people is super exciting. Um, and it's a different kind a different kind of motivation for research than I've had before, but I also like find it really fun and exciting and gratifying to be working in this kind of way. No, definitely. And I, I think um, before, before we do uh, uh, end up on, on, on the arbitrage topic, I, I'd love to mention uh, Stylus, which is, uh, yeah. you know, a potential upgrade that uh, the Octane Labs team is working on, of course. And as you mentioned, if the DAO chooses to kind of let it in, will be implemented on one and Nova. Uh, I, I'd love to maybe, if, if you can, maybe give like a quick summary of what Stylus is and maybe, uh, yeah. you know, maybe what kind of implications that might have uh, for like Arbitrum and maybe the broader Ethereum community. Yeah. So, you know, the Stylus is... I could talk about what value it provides. I'll do that in a minute, but let me talk a little bit about kind of philosophically how it fits in. Sure. Um, so Arbitrum, the Arbitrum chains are EVM chains. They're Ethereum compatible and code that runs on Ethereum will run there. And um, Stylus doesn't change that at all. So, uh, but what Stylus does is it lets a developer write their smart contract code in almost any language they like, almost any programming language that they can compile to WebAssembly or WASM. Um, now, almost every language that people would want to use, C, C++, Rust, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, can be compiled to WASM. So what Stylus lets you do is, is take a 
piece of, is write a smart contract in whatever language you like, compile it to Wasm, and then you can deploy it onto an Arbitrum chain. And what's cool about this is this contract that you've deployed is a first class citizen. It's running on the same chain with a Solidity or EVM contracts. It You can call it in the same way. It understands all of the same types of transactions. Um, it can interact with, um, with Solidity contracts and the Solidity contracts won't even know they're talking to a stylus contract. So it's another way of writing a smart contract that runs seamlessly on the same chain um, so it's EVM plus, that is, it supports the Ethereum virtual machine, the Arbitrum chain that has stylus added, assuming that you add stylus to your chain. Um, it supports the EVM, but it also supports more because it gives you more ways to, um, to write your contract. So why might you want to write a contract in some other language? Well, for one thing, um, People like lots of different programming languages. Solidity is not the best tool for everything. Um, a lot of other languages have a lot of advantages. Um, and you know, I, as a longtime software developer, believe in the right tool for the right job. So use, use the language, use the, the tool set that makes sense for your job. And Stylus lets you do that. Um, but the other thing is that um, because the Arbitrum Nitro stack uses Wasm WebAssembly at, as its sort of fundamental um, proving mechanism. The fraud proofs in, um, in the Arbitrum Nitro stack use Wasm. Um, and are optimized for efficiently proving stuff and efficiently executing Wasm code. Code that you develop via stylus is going to run a lot faster than code that you develop using Solidity um, because the compilers because are more efficient because Wasm is more efficient than EVM by design. Uh, you're going to be able to get, you're going to be able to do more in your contract. You're going to have more ability to customize, to write just what you want. It's going to be able to run faster. So it really opens up the space for new styles of contract development for new ways of programming. And it also increases how much, how much work you can get done with the same amount of gas. Um, so I think it opens up a ton of opportunities. And like I said, it's completely backward compatible and stylus contracts and Solidity or EVM contracts will operate side by side seamlessly with each other. Um, so it's a big win. It doesn't take away anything that was there before. Um, and so this, uh, this will be available as an upgrade to any Arbitrum chain. So the DAO will be able to decide whether to apply it to Arbitrum 1, to Arbitrum Nova. Anyone who's launching their own L3 chain using Arbitrum Orbit, you'll be, uh, you'll be free to use it as well. Um, and if I were launching an L3 chain, I would for sure include um, Stylus. I think it opens up a lot of opportunities. So it's a really exciting um, and fundamental change and improvement um, in what you can do on an Arbitrum chain. Um, and I'm really excited to see what people are going to do with Stylus. Definitely. I, and, I, and I think even, even adding on to that, I feel like it's just going to be like being able to like literally expand the Ethereum community, like uh, by pretty much including yeah. all the people that, as you mentioned, didn't care to learn about Solidity in the past, right? Or, yeah, maybe they didn't care to learn about Solidity. Maybe they need some property that some other language like Rust has. Right. Maybe they want to take some existing code that was written for some other system. They want to have some legacy library that they include in their contract, uh, which is written in, they have some library written in C++, say that they feel like they need to use. You can actually do that. Right, you're not locked out by the need to port everything over to Solidity if you have existing code. So it opens up a ton of opportunities and does it in a way that doesn't take anything away from the user experience or the developer experience. It's purely additive thing. And that's kind of the EVM plus um, philosophy that will support everything in EVM and will support more.
Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, for the rundown there. It's funny. Cause I think like sometimes you get in this kind of like, uh, it's like this bubble in crypto Twitter. Yeah. And like, so, so it's like, you know, here I am thinking everyone already knows about stylus, but it's a lot of people I talk to now that aren't in the ecosystem that are just like, what's stylus? <laughs> so, you know, well, yeah, you either for, they yes. don't, or they think, you know, I think people who maybe have heard a few words about it, um, often think it's less than it is. Yeah. Like stylus is a separate chain yeah. and like your contract. Yeah. You can write a stylus contract, but it can't talk to EVM contracts. People are kind of amazed often when you say no, what it, what it really is. Cause it really does check all the boxes in that way. So moving past arbitrage a little bit, um, yep. I'd love to maybe scratch your brain about something else. Uh, and that's AI, yep. um, you know, being being in the you know in the IT kind of industry the field like you know researching a lot of this stuff for quite some time I'm sure this uh, you know a, a topic that you've probably uh, you know been keeping track of the past I'm sure a couple of months uh, up up until yeah. this point you've had ChatGPT come come about I've seen a lot of deep fakes very specifically of Tom Cruise for some reason I don't know why they're deep faking him a lot uh, what do you make of the current state of AI uh, currently. I mean, we're, we're in a really interesting place. Um, if you look back over like the last 10 years of AI, what you see is progress that's been fast, but very uneven. AI mm. gets much, much better at some things and doesn't get better at some other things. And it's often unpredictable, right? The big, the big to do right now is over, is over these, um, large language models, things like chat GPT and all of the, um, and all of the capabilities they seem to have that you wouldn't have expected. Um, the advances in the technology are constantly surprising us. Um, but still the technology, I, I think one of the lessons is that it's not like AI is one thing. And that one thing is just improving. Like there's like a single bar on the bar graph that just gets bigger and bigger. I sort of think of AI capability as like a, a forest of different like bars of different heights that measure how good AI is at all kinds of different things. And every now and then, like some of the bars will just like leap up and get much bigger. Um, but it, it's clear that it's really transformative. One there's a bunch of lessons. One is progress has been fast, but uneven. I think another thing is that, um, and surprising, but another thing is that um, over and over, people have said, well, AI can do this thing, but this right. other thing, this is like uniquely human and AI is not going to be able to figure out how to do it. And then, you know, AI systems just like, learn to do those things. You know, AI will never be able to um, translate, do language translation as well as a moderately competent bilingual person, or it will ne never be able to uh, make, read a story and make inferences about the emotional states of the characters, or it will never be able to play Go at the level of a human, <laughs> or it will never be able to, um, uh, you know, play, improvise a jazz solo that sounds good. Um, right. <laughs> and, you know, time and again, these systems are able to most of the time do these things. They also have huge problems and limits and blind spots that were, um, that are there as well. Um, but huge impact. Um, one of the things I worked on and, and I worked on this a ton at the White House on um, AI and machine learning. Um, uh, like I said before, um, one of the big issues here is the impact on jobs. And I think this is a really interesting one. Um, people are afraid that AI is going to take all the jobs, um, which I don't think is the case. Uh, what I think is true is that a lot of jobs will change a lot so that the skills you need to do the job are different than they were before. Um, right. Some jobs will get destroyed, some jobs will get created, but there's gonna be a lot more change in the job market, both more jobs created, more jobs destroyed, but also the idea that you start doing a job when you're you know, at some stage in your career and that job is like five years, 10 years, 15 years later is the same. 
as it was, I think that's not the case at all, right? Technology in general, and AI is just going to accelerate this, is changing. What kind of skills you need to have, what sort of things you do all day in a lot of different jobs. So, and this change is, it opens a lot of opportunities, but also it causes a lot of pain and friction. One of my big takeaways from working with, um, uh, from working with some really great economists um, in the White House on these issues around jobs is that turbulence and change in the job market causes a lot of pain for a lot of people. Um, and our economy already has a lot of job turbulence in it. A lot of people, a lot of jobs destroyed, a lot of jobs created. A lot of people are insecure, feel insecure in the jobs they're in. Um, and that causes a lot of real trouble and pain for people. So I think it's going to be a big issue. It's going to be a bumpy ride um, as AI is affecting sort of how we do stuff. Um, and I worry more about the turbulence during the transition than I do about, even about the end state. Um, I'm, I'm not a person who worries that AI is going to destroy us all. I'm more worried that we will do <laughs> stupid stuff with AI that, um, that hurts ourselves. Um, may, and maybe in a really serious way, right? But I think human, I, I'm less worried about machine intelligence than I am about like uh, people doing dumb things with a very powerful tool. Like, are, are we at all worried, like, you know, in any way about like kind of Boston dynamics with their robots, somehow integrating AI with that? That seems a little scary. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I think I think we should be scared and paying close attention to issues around uh, automated weapons. Like the combination of AI and and military weapons is uh, actually potentially a huge, huge, huge problem. And there's a lot of smart people working on this, and um, uh, including many people who are in, um, you know, who are in in militaries who are trying to do the right thing. Um, but we should be paying attention to this and we should be worried about it because it will be a fundamental change in um, that could have a huge impact on sort of the stability of international relationships. Do you think there's any uh, good potential relationship between uh, like AI and like blockchain technology, um, like even talking about nowadays? I mean, I think AI is going to affect everything. I don't right. think blockchain is is special in that respect. Um, I mean, I think I think you will see people, especially in things like uh, financial markets that operate right. um, in the in the blockchain space. You're going to see um, more use of um, of bots in that space. I mean, you already see a lot of say trading bots that operate. Um, but they're going to get smarter. They're going to get, there's going to be more, more of them. Um, but I don't see, I don't, I don't think blockchain is, is unusual in this respect. I think almost every activity that humans do is going to be impacted by AI one way or another. All right. So last question for the day, Ed, I promise you. Okay. Um, been here for quite some time and I think it's been great. Uh, in 2023, what is the biggest threat to national security? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> Do you for a doozy maybe, there, right? <laughs> right. So, I mean, I think if you're talking about the United States. Um, yes. Yeah. So, I think you can point to a bunch of things for the United States. I think domestic terrorism is a serious, uh, is a serious concern. Um, the right less so probably than international terrorism, which has been a worry for some time. I think I am more worried about, um, that we'll have uh, people for, um, very ill because of very ill-advised views about um, or you know dangerous views about domestic politics um, uh, turning to turning to political violence um, to me that's the biggest risk we face um, I think if you're talking about international affairs and international security there's um, 
I think there are a bunch of of problem areas internationally where um, where where there's a lot at stake and where things could go wrong and where it's very important that the international community be involved. But if you're talking about national security of the United States that affects us sort of sitting here, um, to me, domestic terrorism is the biggest issue. Gotcha. I think I, I apologize, by the way, I think I had to make you step around a lot of different like potential minds there <laughs> with that question. <laughs> it's a cut. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult question, but it's an important one. I felt like, um, yeah. I considered saying I didn't want to answer it, but that seemed kind of unfair. Um, no, no, that you know, would have been fine. <laughs> I mean, it would have been fine, but also I feel like it is an issue that I have paid attention to these national security things. I've been involved in government. I've like been in the room when the president talks about some important national security issues. So I feel like I have, I'm by no means a leading national security expert, but I do have some expertise and it's an important question. Well, it's, it's, I think, I think it's, it's definitely a relevant one. Cause I, I do feel like every, you know, like every so often you have like this new thing that comes about and, and people yeah. claim, you know, it's like, like, like a new threat of national security has emerged. And in the case that you just mentioned, like AI, yeah. right. So many people thinking that that's, that's a national yeah. threat in some certain capacity, but. I mean, I think it, if, you know? yeah, if you're talking about the longer term, I think worrying that, um, that AI and especially automated weapons will sort of destabilize the uh, international relations is something we should really worry about. Right. Um, because there's a lot that we don't understand. The things will happen we probably can't anticipate. It's I think it's really important that people will be thinking about how, how to guide that future. Um, because it's not easy. There's not a, there's not a simple answer. Um, totally. But at the same time, there's a lot of risk and it could lead to a lot of change. Right. No, it definitely makes sense. Yeah, no, listen, that, that's, that's, um, I think that's something that like, you know, as, as time goes on, the, uh, the, uh, the, the obvious answer will be hopefully a little more clear, uh, especially if it is just happens to include yeah. or anything like that. <laughs> I mean, you don't, I but, think you'd never know what people are often surprised by threats that, in hindsight, at you know, you say, "Well, we should have been worried about this thing." Uh, we're yeah. we're not we were not worried. Whatever it is that burns you, you like think afterwards. Oh, I should have been more worried about that before. But without the benefit of hindsight, you often don't know. And there's a certain sense of sort of the importance of resiliency and international relationships to try to um, try to make sure that. You know, not only that, like if you're one country, but even if you're more importantly, part of the broad international community that's trying to maintain p international peace and order, um, that you have the relationships and that you have structures that are robust so that when things happen, you have a chance of, of working together to try to manage the situation. Hundred percent, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, I, 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 def I definitely agree. It, it's funny because I do think like um, a lot of like a lot of the things that we that we kind of spoke about, uh, kind of throughout throughout this first episode here, uh, kind of ties together like a little bit in, in the sense that like we're all kind of trying to build and like uh, help each other uh, come up with solutions to all these very very yeah. difficult problems. Like you may, you know, they may not always come out to like something very tangible, but like at yeah. the end of the day, at the end of the day, it really builds towards, um, uh, you know, who knows, maybe a potential solution or, or someone else you can kind of hand the baton off. Yeah. To, I mean, we're to trying to, and solution. I think there's, you know, for sure, this idea that we're trying to build a way to live together and to interact in a way that is fair and safe for people. Um, and that lets people thrive. Um, yeah, that's hard to do. Right. Um, one of the things I always hope for is that people in the blockchain space are able to learn from the millennia of experience that humanity has in figuring out, trying different ways and trying to learn and think about ways of working together and, uh, and interacting. I think there's a lot of wisdom that we can take as well as some uh, cautionary 
examples from uh, what's happened outside the blockchain space over time. Um, and but it's important for us to learn to learn from what we can learn from outside the blockchain space. Sometimes I feel like blockchain people want to reinvent everything from first principles, and it's useful to think about <laughs> what it's useful to think about that. But also, you know, it's really important to learn from other people's mistakes. And there's a long history of people sort of making mistakes and getting better at understanding how to how to live and work together. Amen to that. Well, Ed, I appreciate you for coming on uh, today's podcast. Uh, and yeah, we like hopefully we'll, we'll have you on again, you know? <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it. I'd be happy to come back. Thank you for watching this week's episode of Beneath the Layers. If you're interested in listening to more, make sure to check us out on YouTube or on any of the other major podcasting platforms. Also, we're hiring. So if you're interested in uh, working on cutting edge tech, scaling Ethereum, et cetera, make sure to apply at jobs.lever.co forward slash off chain labs. Additionally, a disclaimer, nothing in this podcast should be taken or understood as financial advice of any kind. Uh, and all opinions expressed by the host, myself, or the guests are solely their opinions, my opinions, and do not reflect the opinions of off chain labs as a company. All that being said, thank you for watching. See you guys in the next one.